morning, everyone. It's great to be with you again here. Before we begin our service, I just want to encourage you or instruct you or exhort you or do anything that I can get you to do to go and pick up a Bible if you don't have one with you. Let's get a Bible in front of you this morning as we gather together for worship. Meeting together online is a little bit different, so where we could put the words up on the screen in person, we, we just can't really do that here. So it's really important that you have a Bible, you can follow along and see what we're saying here as we go through it. There's time now to nip up and grab one. If uh, you can pause this, if you want, want to get one. But I just really encourage you now so that you can follow along and make sense of what we're going to be talking about. We're going to be in Isaiah chapter 9 um, for our reading uh, and verse 7. And if you want to turn there to get ready, that's fine. Um, but before we get there, we're going to be uh, call the worship. is from Psalm 27, verses 1 to 4. If you want, you can follow along in Psalm 27, or you can just listen now as we come together as one family, sharing his word and worshipping our God. Psalm 27 says this, The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evildoers assail me to devour my flesh, my ad ad adversaries and foes, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war rise up against me, yet I will be confident. One thing I ask of the Lord that I will seek after, to live in the house of the Lord and all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple. Let's pray together. Lord, as we come together as a people um, this morning or this evening or this afternoon, whenever we are, are gathered and watching this, Lord, we pray that you would turn our eyes to you. Lord, we know that you are glorious, that you are light, Lord, and you are life itself. That apart from you that we can do nothing. Father, we know this and yet so often we turn from this. So often we forget of all the good things that you've done for us. And we play the comparison game. We look at other people, we look at other things and, and, and Lord, we confess that we envy. That we think life's not fair to us. Lord, in those times, we pray that you would just turn us and to see that, that, yes, life is not fair because we deserve so much worse, but that you have given us such riches and such glory in your presence. Lord, we pray in the, in the dark times in our lives that you would turn us towards you. When we are at our worst, Lord, when sin is eating us up, we pray, Lord, that you would turn our eyes towards you you would help us to repent and to come home. Lord, we know your goodness and yet we forget it so much. We ask that this morning that you would help us to leave all those concerns at the door, to focus now, to, to zone in on what you have for us, that your word would change us, Lord, that would speak into our hearts and our lives and illuminate those parts of the heart, Lord, that we need to confess and you would strengthen us and build us up as your people. We ask all these things in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Thank you. 
Father, as we approach you in prayer of this Lenten season, blanket us with your grace. Help us not to worry or doubt about past concerns or what lies ahead, but to rest assured in the knowledge that you hold our past and future in your loving hands and that your timing is perfect for all our needs. Inspire us to keep faith in you at the forefront of our thoughts. Put a spirit of service and gratitude into our hearts to love as we have been loved, to forgive as we have been forgiven, to help as we have been helped. And so be your messengers of love, forgiveness and help to all we meet. Heavenly Father, forgive us where we have failed you. We pray for your word, a word created by you and grants your peace and equality. And yet today, in so many areas, it cased in seemingly endless conflict and division. The horrors in Mozambique, a mindless example of the marginal value of human life. Heavenly Father, our prayer is that the waste places of your word be made new again, that the wicked be routed and the righteous shout with joy. Bring hope to millions in fear and despair. Calm and strengthen the innocent and defenceless. Dry the tears of frightened souls. Affirm to them your ever caring love. Plant within world leaders your caring wisdom. Strengthen medical services around your world as they face daily trauma and bringing hope for the injured and bereaved. Our prayer this morning is that your kingdom advance on earth as it is in heaven. Come quickly, Lord. Oh, come quickly to heal your broken world. We pray for our province as it continues its challenging and at times faltering steps in self-government. Continue to implant within our politicians a desire to serve the common good, a desire in which ancient tribal ideals are a past memory and no longer a current ambition or indeed a current relevance. In your mercy, bring the prolonged negotiations of the Brexit Protocol to a just and honourable conclusion and as plans are being advanced to celebrate the centenary of our province, grant that each of us in our daily living will play our part in creating a new history which can be proudly celebrated in generations to come. Merciful God, who bears the pain of the world, look with compassion on the sick. Release continuing help for the millions in all quarters of your world infected with the corona pandemic. Give thankful hearts to those who may have survived. Hold in your care the bereaved. We give thanks for the range of vaccines now on offer and pray for his equitable distribution and injection. We give thanks for all making sacrificial efforts to lead us through the virus dangers, from skilled medics to lorry drivers, from parents to teachers, from office workers to street cleaners, from journalists to shop workers, for all are interlinked in sustaining the health of your people everywhere. Give insight and wisdom to all who govern, steer them through their challenging decisions of lockdown and their subsequent easing. And may we as individuals play our part towards a healthier life for all through our careful and responsible personal behaviour. Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christian community as its traditional places of worship become and continue to be casualties of lockdown. Congregations dispersed and denied collective worship that supported faith and sustained fellowship. Happily, the response of your church worldwide confirms the ancient adage, the church does not close, merely its buildings. Congregations, including our own at Stormont, continued worship through online recorded services and prayer meetings and Bible study, continued via Zoom. We pray for our congregation here, for Alban and the committed team around them. Give to each a vivid sense of your direction and our generous and grateful thanks for their determined leadership in these past difficult months. Be near to those of our congregation who are ill, those weary in spirit, those who grieve. Lead each to a new and happier dawn. 
be close to young people everywhere at this time with unique uncertainty in their lives. In their anxiety, be their hope. Surround them with wise counsel, which leads them to the truth that your grace is sufficient for all their needs. In your name we pray. Amen. In our sermon series so far, we've been going through John's Gospel, thinking about the God who is closer than we think. And hopefully we've picked up that, that John is trying to put a light upon Jesus. And the way that he does this is through read, using the reader's awareness of the resurrection to, to shine light backwards on Jesus. And the reader's awareness of the Old Testament to shine light forwards towards Jesus. And so using both the, the resurrection and the Old Testament, we are supposed to see something different about Jesus. Now with Easter coming up, we are going to be looking soon at the resurrection. So this morning we're going to be looking back to the light shining forwards to Jesus in the Old Testament. So if you've got your thumb in Isaiah 9, flip over there now. Pat is going to read from us from there, um, starting at verse 2. Now she's going to be using a paraphrase, um, but do try and follow along with whatever version you have at home. Some of the words might seem different, but, but we're going to walk through them and highlight some of the important phrases. And so hopefully we will understand exactly what's going on and what it means for us today. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you, as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke, the, the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor, you have broken, as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the tramping warriors, and all the garments rolled in blood, shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders, and he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and furthermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. So how does this verse act as a light shining forwards towards Jesus? And what does it tell us about him? Well, firstly, we have an echo of this in, in the start of John's Gospel, where Isaiah says, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them has a light shone. John says, The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. If you look a little further down in John 1, you'll see that Jesus is being called the true light who's coming into the world. So we have this idea of, of light and being connected with salvation. And in both Isaiah and in John, this light is contrasted with the image of darkness. Now John lets the reader assume this great spiritual darkness, but in Isaiah it's really explicit. The context of this prophecy is of an evil king who's turned away from God. If you want, you can look back over chapter 8 where we see the people having spoken against God, having acted with pride and rebelled against God, trusting upon their own strength rather than upon God. And the result is this gloom, this, this deep darkness where the people have given themselves over to sin. This is a land of, of blindness and corruption, of suffering and under condemnation. If Jesus is the light, if God is the light, and this darkness represents a land devoid of his goodness. Not just neutral, but as verse 1 says, in anguish. So there is a really dark backdrop for light to shine into. But we should also note the setting for this light coming. In, in verse 1 in Isaiah and in John as well, it's Galilee. The light coming from Galilee, points us directly to Jesus, as, as that was where he was from, where he grew up, where he spent lots of his ministry, where he appears after the resurrection. So it definitely points us to Jesus telling us who this prophecy is about. But it is also significant because Galilee is called 
Galilee of the nations, here in Isaiah in verse 1, or in Matthew 4, Galilee of the Gentiles. Now there's a lot of cultural things that that would say to the Jews of the time, but I'm just going to say that this is saying that, that God is going to save people based upon his plans and not upon the kind of things that we think should come. So for the Jews, that was ethnicity and, and belonging to a certain family line. For us, maybe that's, that's good works or, or acting or appearing in a certain way. The light shines where it shines. The people had nothing to do with it. It all starts with the light. We have to work hard to keep that in mind. We don't start thinking about ourselves and, and try and justify our lives to God. But that we start with him and that our lives become a reflection of, into that. God acts first. The light shines. Jesus comes. And now we move on to verse 3 where we see the result of that light shining. Where it says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. So previously they had lived in darkness, which is a, a symbol of, of death and decrease. But now the idea is that, that God has multiplied them beyond where they ever were. Now this should bring to mind you the promises to, to Abraham that his descendants would be more numerous than the stars. It's a little phrase that just bursts with, with God's faithfulness to his promise, his goodness to his people, his blessing upon them. Light and life brought together here. Just like in John 1 verse 4, in him was life and the life was the light of man. And what could bring more joy to people who were, who were cut off from God's blessing, living in anguish? Childlessness and not being able to have kids is, is such a terrible thing and, and really obvious in the scriptures as a symbol of, of just devastation. But the contrast, having kids, is always seen as a joy and a blessing. So here is that blessing extended to the nation and just increased abundantly. They exist under God's blessing once again. They have been connected to that goodness and their joy is evident. It's the joy, as you read here, of a starving people seeing the harvest come in. It's the joy of warriors dividing spoils. Now, that image might not hit us culturally, but imagine the relief of having survived a battle, the thrill of victory, the idea that your family were safe and also that you had suddenly the wealth to protect them and bless them. That is an image of utter joy. So the light shines where it shines. And what it brings to those that it shines on is joy. So we have darkness to light, anguish to joy. And then in verses 4, 5 and 6, we are hit with three fours in a row. Verse 4, for the yoke of his burden. Verse 5, for every boot. And verse 6, for to us a child is born. Now the same Hebrew word starts these lines and, and it, it shows, it's showing the consequences of the light shining being the reason for this joy. So what does it mean that the light has shone? Why do we have joy? It says, for this reason, for this reason, and for this reason. So firstly, let's look at verse 4. For the yoke of his burden. Now to really get into this, we need to understand what it says there about the day of Midian. And because we usually read this at Christmas, um, we don't get these battle images, we don't go into these battle images too much, and they don't get our full attention. But this day it is a battle image, and it's referring to Judges 6 and 7, where, where Israel is turned away from the Lord, and he allows the Midianites to come in and rule over Israel. In Judges 6, we read that they destroyed Israel's livelihood, leaving no sustenance for the people. Then God raises up Gideon, and we have the story about how he organizes this huge army, but God slowly whittles it down to 300 people just so he could show it was him that gave the victory. So they have joy like on the day of Midian when they were freed from an oppressor and restored to being a nation. This should evoke for us freedoms of, of slavery and, and freedom. So the light shines and they have joy for they were freed from bondage. Then in verse 5, look where it says, For every boot of the tramping warrior will be burned as fuel for the fire. You might read something differently in your translation there, but, um, or if you're following along in a paraphrase, but, but the Hebrew sets this up as the next four, the next reason for joy. And what it gives us is an image of peace. 
of the clothing of the warriors burned up, their uniforms no longer needed. Earlier in Isaiah, you might recall, there's the famous line about beating the swords into plowshares. And this is a similar imagery to, to signify the end of violence. Now, it's not clear whether this, this refers to, to Israel's enemy, enemies or, or mankind in general, but because we certainly know that accepting Jesus doesn't lead to an easy life. It could refer to us laying down our, of our own arms and, and peace reigning in our hearts, or, or it could mean a, a general sense of protection. But the underlying point, either way, is that peace reigns. The light shines and they have joy, for peace reigns. And look with me now at verse 6. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given. Freedom, peace, and our child. And we could think of this as just another blessing, like another good thing. But if it were just about the joy of having children like, like earlier, then we'd expect this to be a plural. Like, we're all free, we, we all have peace, and, and we'll all have children. But this isn't plural. It's referring to one child. Something that brings this blessing to its culmination. Better than freedom. Better than peace. This child. And we find out that his name shall be Wonderful Counselor. Mighty God. Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. And we could spend all day looking at the intricacies of these titles. But, but let's just note a few things here. Firstly, that this is a, a royal list of ultimate attributes. Wonderful counsellor. We should not just approve of his counsel, but wonder at it. It is wisdom beyond our understanding. It is the wisdom of the true king. Mighty God, the strength of not just a mortal, but of God. Everlasting Father brings the sense of, of authority and, and that authority having no end, but also the compassion and the tenderness and the protection of a father exhibited the beyond what a human can show. And finally, Prince of Peace, ending with an explicitly royal title and the mention of Shalom. The wholeness, the completeness of peace, not just in the sense that we've already talked about, but in a peace in ourselves as, as we meet the end for which we are created. Wisdom, strength, compassion, completion. But the sense that we should get here is not of a very good king. It's not saying this, this child will be the best version of humanity. Don't think of someone who is really wise and then mix that with someone who is really strong. Because this image is of something beyond us. Something that we try and describe these ways, but we can never really come close to encapsulating. This is about God. And ultimately we find that the light shines and we have joy. For God is with us. For Emmanuel has come. The light, which is the life of all mankind, doesn't just bring gifts, but brings the giver. Better than freedom, better than peace. Is Jesus. And in Jesus, we get God. We get a relationship with the Almighty. We get union with the fount of all blessing. Our passage ends in verse 7 with, which is more messianic imagery and the reminder that it's the Lord that does this. That the light shines where it wills, not because of us, not because we deserve it or have attracted him to us in some way, but because of his zeal. This passage shines forward on Jesus to reveal that he is our joy, that he is the cause of our joy, that, he, that his saving works enable us to find ultimate joy of walking in his light. We can see that he is different to everyone else because he can, he can actually fulfill that aching need of our souls. Now I know going through that, that was very quick and I'd really encourage you to just to go through it again later a bit slower and think about every verse. What is it saying? What does it reveal about Jesus? What, what light is shining forwards? What is it trying to get us to think or feel about God? Go Go to a quiet place, get a, get a cup of coffee and just, just chew over these verses. If you are relying upon this sermon or this service to feed you spiritually for the rest of the week, you will starve. Get into this text because you will, able, you will be able to see it speaking 
more abundantly in your life than I can ever hope to apply. Take some time to let this joy actually seep into your soul. I know after 10 minutes of listening to me, none of you will feel the joy that this verse is describing. So don't let that be the faith that you're settling for. Don't let this be the extent of your engagement. If you want to know what it was like to have the joy that comes from the light shining on you, then you need to be illuminated. You need to spend more time reading, praying, seeking the Lord. This verse is spoken to people. The echoes in John are spoken to people, some of whom believe who have their eyes open and their hearts stirred, who know that they have, they have need, that they need the words of life that only Jesus has. When you switch this service off and, and you go for lunch or, or whatever it is you're going to do, the world will once again, as it always does, try and wrestle you into believing that you can satisfy your soul on the material comforts and the desire for fulfillment that the world offers. But think of the disciples when they say in John 6, 68, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. You might make a really good Sunday roast. But will it bring you the joy of being freed from slavery? You might enjoy some TV show. But will it bring you the joy of having peace break out? You might do literally anything else. But it won't bring you the joy of the light of life. Where will you go? Here we have the words of eternal life. Words that will bring us joy as we see the light shine in our lives. This joy, this, this glory is the light shining forward to illuminate Jesus. To put him in the spotlight so that we can look to him and know that he is the way, that he is the truth, that he is the life. That he alone will satisfy. That he alone can, can cut through the darkness in our lives. That he alone can save us. This verse shines forward so that we can see Jesus and that we need him. That we need to seek him. That we need to cry out to him. That he is the one to follow. We're coming up to Easter and my prayer is that we can prepare for that holiday. And that you will have seen Jesus so clearly. You will spend enough time chewing on these verses that you can taste that joy in your life. And I pray that the light will shine in our hearts and lives. Let's pray together. Lord, we ask that you would shine your light in our lives. Lord, we ask for the times when we are almost trying to shelter from that light, that we are trying to hide from it. That we're trying to just move on with our, our lives and, and not let the light affect us. We pray, Lord, that your glory would not allow us to do that. We pray that as you speak to us now through the readings, through the songs, the prayers, through your word. That, Lord, you would grab our hearts. You would light up our lives, Lord, and bring that joy. Father, we pray for those of us who still walk in darkness. Whether we claim to or not or hide or pretend or whatever that is, Lord. We pray for those who haven't met you. And we ask that you would shine in their lives now. That Lord, as a people, as a nation, we would come to know your light in this place once again. And that you would shine forth and then we could leave here with hymns of praise on our lips. Be with us now, Lord. Because in your name we pray. Amen.
Let's come together and pray um, as we finish our service using the words that our Lord taught us. Our Father. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore.